Well, last week, Rob kicked off the series titled Better For It. Um, and the series is all about whenever we go through life, whether we're facing opportunity or whether we're facing challenges, we want to be better for it. And if you're an athlete and you've heard the, the uh, phrase, no pain, no gain, the assumption there is if I go through pain or difficulty or challenge, that I'll grow through that. And that's not always a great assumption. Uh, we have a choice in how whatever we're experiencing impacts us. And so that's what this series focuses on. Now, Rob last week reminded us, no matter what we're facing, that God is with us. And I love the verse that he shared, uh, Philippians 4.13, and that was an encouragement to me where he reminded us that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so whether I'm in a season of just unparalleled blessing or whether I'm in a challenging season, whatever I'm being called to, God strengthens me. And then he end, ended with this challenge for us to renew, uh, renew our call to follow and trust in Jesus, whether that's a faith that we're renewing or whether that's something that we're beginning for the very first time. And as I've thought about what this year holds, in some ways the beginning of a year is a lot like a blank slate. I mean, who knows what's going to happen in 2022 um, it would be interesting to see a year from now as we're entering into 2023 to see what has God accomplished and what's happened in our lives. What are some of the good things that are, are, will happen this year? But we also want to recognize that there's challenges this year. We all thought we would be done with this pandemic by now and we're facing new challenges with the pandemic. Um, and then there's others of you that are facing situations in your lives personally, professionally, some other aspect of your life that probably make the pandemic pale in comparison. And I think if there's any reality of the past two years, it's the reminder that we are not in as much control as we think we are. I think most of the time we kind of labor under the illusion that we can control our lives, that we can control our destinies and our outcome. But the reality is we have less control than we think we do. And that's where your superpower comes in. Now, over Christmas, uh, our family uh, took some time just to do something fun, and we went to see the most recent Spider-Man movie. Now, I'm not a huge superhero fan, but with particularly with our boys, and actually my daughters too, we've enjoyed kind of going to see the superhero movies throughout the years. And growing up, probably of all the superheroes, Spider-Man was definitely my favorite. And I think he was my favorite because he's the most relatable, if superheroes can be relatable. He seems the most human. You know, he's not from another planet. He can't fly. He's earthbound. Now, he can kind of zoom around a little bit. Um, and he also, especially in this last movie, relied on those that were closest to him to defeat his enemies. But no superhero can defeat their enemies if they don't use their superpowers. And so for Spider-Man, that means he can climb up walls, he's got superhuman strength, and he can shoot webs out of his hands or his wrists, though I guess depending on which, which Spider-Man we're talking about, it's a feat of engineering versus actually a superpower. But you also, like Spider-Man, have a superpower that you can deploy whenever you find yourself in a challenging situation. And it's a super p the power that allows you to shift things from bad to good and right from wrong. It enables you to uh, hinder the intentions of evil people, but it's also easy to lose sight of when we're in the midst of a challenging situation. And your superpower is what I'm calling respond ability. The ability for us to choose a response rather than react. It's your ability to choose rather than having your response dictated by the circumstances. And the truth is that we're no better than our response in any situation that we find ourselves, but our response can make things better. And even when things seem out of control, we can control our response. Now, I want to contrast the, to responding to reacting. Reacting sets us up to mirror the people and situations that we, that we don't respect. Or, um, and unfortunately, reacting is often our natural response. At least it is for me. 
Sometimes I don't even realize I'm reacting. In fact, sometimes I have to take a step back and go, am I reacting or am I responding to the situation that's in front of me? But reactive, reacting negatively impacts our outcomes and it negatively impacts the people that are in proximity to us. And reacting keeps us stuck in the situation that we're in. But wisely choosing our response allows us to shape our outcomes and it changes us. And we've been invited to live that kind of life. In fact, our faith history is populated with men and women who faced challenging situations and chose to respond wisely. They choose to respond in unexpected and maybe even unnatural ways. And sometimes, because they did it, they changed the course of history. In fact, uh, if I went through and took time to look at Hebrews chapter 11, there's the long history of people of faith who trusted God, sometimes in the midst of really challenging and over, overwhelming circumstances. And sometimes they triumphed, and sometimes they suffered. But they trusted God in whatever situation that they found themselves in. Now, one of those people that's referenced in Hebrews chapter 11 is a biblical character who exercised his superpower for more than 20 years. And his story illustrates the power to choose and respond wisely and it ends with the hero in the story saying this. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Now, these words were spoken to those who had power over this young man and the, who used that power to bring evil into his life. In fact, he was betrayed by those that were closest to him that should have been looking out for him. But as we walk through the story, what we see is that God's intentions and purposes uh, are clear, and they became reality because this young man exercised his superpower, and he responded wisely in the midst of adverse situation. He literally changed the course of history, including our faith history, and this young man was Joseph. And so if you'll grab a Bible or jump on the Grace Fishers app, uh, if you're grabbing one of our Bibles, it's towards the front uh, in the book of Genesis, and we're going to be on page 33. And while you're turning there, I want to say hello to our friends online. We're glad that you're joining us. Um, and we are going to talk about the story of Joseph. Now, Joseph, just to be clear, there's lots of Josephs in the Scripture. It's not, we're not talking about the Father Jesus. We're talking about the Old Testament Joseph. Joseph was a very common name in the Hebrew world. And so he was the great-grandson of Abraham, who was the father of the Jewish people. And so it goes Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob in that lineage. And Jacob had a very big and complicated family that ultimately became um, the kind of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so um, Jacob had four wives and 12 sons, big complicated family. Now Joseph was one of the youngest sons. Um, and if you have a little brother, I have a little brother, um, little brothers can sometimes be annoying. And parents um, are, try to generally, I think as a parent, sometimes you're a little more protective of your younger kids. That may or may not be true. And sibling rivalry is somewhat normal, though I think most parents work hard to minimize it. Susie and I would always tell our kids we don't have favorites. My parents told me that, though I was convinced that my little brother definitely was the favorite. And so... And you're probably thinking of who was the favorite in your life or in your, in your family's life. But the reality is that Joseph's dad wasn't concerned about not communicating who his favorite was. And Joseph was his father's favorite. He wasn't worried about hiding it. In fact, he made it clear to everybody that Joseph was the favorite son. In fact, he uh, bought him a special robe, and you know, clothing was different from what we're used to. They would wear a long kind of flowing tunic or garment, and they would wear it uh, often day after day. Uh, they didn't have a whole closet full of clothes. And so everywhere Joseph went, it was like he was wearing a t-shirt that said, I'm dad's favorite. And that really irked his brothers. Um, they really began to hate him for it because they were jealous and they disliked him. And then there were a couple other things that Joseph did that frustrated his brothers. First, he was a dreamer, and he was young and probably a little unwise, and he went around and telling everybody his dreams. In fact, one of his dreams was 
that everybody in his family ultimately was going to bow down to him, and that doesn't endear you to your family members either. And Joseph was also a little bit of a tattletale, and in fact, his dad would periodically send him to go check on his brothers while they were taking care of the sheep, and that's actually where we begin the story in Genesis chapter 37 in verse 14. And Joseph's father says to him, go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back to me and bring me a report. And so Jacob sent him on his way, and Joseph tra traveled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. Now, it takes Joseph a little while to get there to find his brothers, but it says that his brothers um, saw him coming, and they're kind of fed up with him, and there's something in them that snaps. In verse 18, it says, When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance, and as he approached, they made plans to kill him. So again, silvering the rivalry a little bit off the chart here. He said, here comes the dreamer. Come on, let's kill him and throw him in one of these cisterns, one of the wells, and we can tell a father or a wild animal has eaten him, and then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. And as we continue on in the story, we see what develops after Joseph arrives is that Judah, who was one of the older brothers, but wasn't one of the oldest, but clearly was one of his leaders, had a different idea. And so Judah says, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. So there were some traders that traversed through the area. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and bread, blood, and his brothers agreed. And so there's a little bit of hint of mercy from the brothers, not a lot. They decide not to kill him, but instead they're just going to kidnap him and sell him into slavery. And then they take a young goat, which they kill. They put the blood on the robe that his father knew and loved so well and that Joseph was so recognizable. And they took it and they deceived their father and his heart was broken, uh, as any of us would be if we've lost a child. Now, we're going to jump over ahead into the story into chapter 39 because we're going to see that uh, the story continues. And, and honestly, in some ways, things go from bad to worse for Joseph. But I want to make one comment on chapter 38. Judah, who is referenced in this first part, there's a little bit of a detour where we tell Judah's story. And I believe this is in there to intentionally contrast Joseph's faithfulness with Judah's lack of faithfulness, but you can go read that at another time. It says this in Genesis 39, verse 1. When Joseph was taken to Egypt, Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased, purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So the captain of the guard would have been like Pharaoh. Pharaoh was like the Egyptian king. It was his personal bodyguard. And so Pharaoh or, uh, uh, Potiphar held a pretty important role in the kingdom. And then in verse 2, we get what I think is a really puzzling statement, if you're really thinking about the story. It begins this way. It says, the Lord was with Joseph. Really? Now, if you look at the story from the outside, it certainly doesn't look like it. At this point, Joseph's been kidnapped. He's been sold twice because he gets sold to the Ishmaelite traders, and then he gets sold to the Egyptians, and he's enslaved. But the reality is, I think some of us know this story too well, and so we skip to the end of the story. And I don't want you to do that today. I want you to sit in the story and try to experience what Joseph has experienced Almost overnight, Joseph goes from favored to forgotten. He's gone from being the favored one to suddenly his family has no idea where he has. The other benefit that I think we bring to this story is that we have the perspective of the scriptures and all the promises that we read in the scriptures about how God will never leave us or forsake us. And what you have to remember about Joseph is that all he had to go off were a few stories from his dad, from his grandfather, and his great-grandfather. Stories of God's promise to bless him, stories of God's faithfulness, how God appeared to them. And I wonder which one of those stories he had heard that planted in this, uh, this idea in Joseph's heart that God was with him regardless of his circumstances. And so Joseph, in the midst of overwhelmingly difficult circumstances, chooses to respond 
as if he believes that God is with him. He chose faith over fear, he chose assurance over anger, and he trusts that God was with him in spite of all the injustice that's happened to him and all the unfair circumstances. And again, it's a reminder from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, where it says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And thus, this is what the ancients were commended for. That's that hall of faith of people who trusted God, and that's the NIV translation. But it's a reminder that sometimes in life we have to exercise faith and trust that what God says is true, even though the things around us don't show that it's true. And I think one of the challenges for us is that if you've grown up with a version of Christianity that says, hey, God's with us, and if I do all the right things, that God will bless me and everything will always turn out right. But the reality is, is that we live in a broken world, and sometimes that brokenness impacts our lives. And while it's true that God blesses us, we will all face pain and injustice and adversity, and, but God is faithful to see us through. And I think the reality is for those followers of Jesus who live in the parts of the world where uh, pain and suffering and persecution are normal parts, um, their faith is regularly challenged, and they have to believe this, I think, in a way that we don't. But for some reason, Joseph believed this, and we see in chapter 2, it says, The Lord was with Joseph, and so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master, Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. Now, I was struck by this phrase that says, as he served, it was clearly evident to everybody that saw Joseph that the way he served, he was serving in a way that was wholehearted, in a way that trusted God. Again, he chose to be faithful, and he honored his Egyptian master, even though none of us wants to have a master Joseph was in a season where he was mostly bringing blessing to others. And sometimes we find ourselves in seasons like that. So Potiphar loves this arrangement. Everything that Joseph does is blessed. And so he continues to give Joseph more responsibility, eventually makes him his right-hand man, his personal attendant. Joseph oversees everything in Potiphar's house. And it says, the the scriptures say that Potiphar had to only think about what he was going to eat. It's like Potiphar's on a cruise. Joseph is taking care of everything. And again, none of this really benefits Joseph. He's enslaved and cut off from his family and those that love him. But he's laboring and serving in a way that benefits all of those around him. Now, Potiphar didn't just have one master, and things are about to get even more complicated in the story because uh, Joseph actually had a second master, and this was Potiphar's wife. And down in verse 6, it says, Joseph was very handsome and a well-built young man, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. Now, remember, Joseph can't leave the situation. It's not like he can switch employers. He can't quit his job. He's truly in a no-win situation. And so he does everything, uh, he does everything he can to avoid Potiphar's wife. But the truth is, he's likely going to end up dead. He's definitely not going to be better for it. But even in the midst of this, he chooses to deploy his superpower. And in verse 8, the story continues, and it says, uh, Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household, No one here has more authority than I do. He's held nothing back from me except for you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. And so we see from Joseph's own lips that his conviction is that he's not really serving Potiphar. He's serving before God. But he, because of that, he responds honorably in a way that honors his Egyptian master. And so Joseph does all that he can do to avoid her and stay away from her. And she continues her pursuit until one day she gets fed up and she accuses him from rape, as, of rape. And Potiphar, obviously his master, takes action. So down in verse 20. And so it says, Potiphar took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. 
Now, there's something incredibly depressing here. I mean, Joseph's situation was difficult to begin with, but being thrown in a jail, and it's not like he has any, uh, there's any sense that he's going to get out of this anytime soon. He's gone from enslaved to imprisoned to forgotten to doubly forgotten. And I don't know if you've ever been in a literal prison, but for a few years when I was just out of college, I used to go up to the Pendleton Reformatory and do a Bible study with some guys there. And there is something like the sound of prison doors closing behind you and the clank. And that was for me who knew that I was getting out in an hour or two, but I can't imagine what it's like to walk into a setting like that and have no idea when you're gonna see the light of day or to see freedom. And I think it's appropriate for us, we're going to maintain the tension of the story. Because the reality is that most of our lives, we don't know the end of the story. We're living in the tension of the middle of it, where we don't know um, what the end is going to look like. And we need to remember, especially if we're walking with somebody, um, to give them grace that in the middle of the story, we don't always know how the story is going to end. And we need to give them grace. But the reality, like I said, is that we can not only change our circumstances by how we respond, but we are changed by how we respond. Adversity reveals character. I think it begins to show what's there. And adversity also shapes character. And sometimes we don't know what's there until it's tested. In fact, I ran across uh, Psalm 105, and it was, again, recounting the history of the Jewish people. And it said something interesting. It said that God was testing Joseph's character. And so his character was revealed uh, by what he experienced. Now, what about you as you head into this year? You may be facing a difficult or a challenging situation, could be vocationally something in your job. Maybe you've got a boss that's difficult. Maybe it's financial. Maybe there's something spiritually going on in your life, or maybe there's something relational, or maybe there's just some other personal situation going on. But if someone were in your situation and they knew that God was was with them, how would they respond? What would it look like to exercise faith over fear and assurance that God was with them rather than anger? What would it look like to live in a way as if God is still with you? Now, the focus of the story is focused, or the focus of this story, Joseph's story, is on our response, us being faithful in the midst of difficulty. But again, I want to balance it with the truth of what we heard last week from Rob, is that regardless of how we respond, that God is still with us because we will never respond perfectly. And God isn't asking you to do it perfectly if you're in the midst of a difficult situation. But as I was thinking about the story this week, I had a couple of stories come to mind almost immediately um, of people in my life who have walked faithfully in the midst of difficulty. And one of the first that came to mind was my dad. My dad had a five-year journey with an illness. This is a picture of him. Uh, I remember the first time he came to my house and said, man, I'm having difficulty with my arms. I'm just, I don't know if it's I'm getting older, I'm losing strength, and I had to help him lift his suitcases into the car uh, as he was heading out on a trip. And he was eventually diagnosed with ALS. But the thing I learned from watching my dad in the midst of that difficulty was I don't believe he ever doubted God And he maintained this incredible sense of humor in the midst of whatever he faced, even some really difficult and awkward situations. And the other story that I thought of was uh, Tom Wager, who is our safety officer. He serves almost every weekend out in the lobby, and you might know Tom. He's also a Fisher's police officer. And Tom has been incredibly faithful as he has responded to the challenge of walking with cancer. We shared Tom's story a couple of years ago, so Tom is really open about sharing his story. In fact, one of the things that I love about Tom, besides his optimism, is his desire to have his story be used for good. And so he's really open. I texted him this week. He's actually on vacation with his family in Florida. He got away. He was hopeful he'd be able to get away. But I love the way that Tom has been able to use this difficulty to point people to Jesus and to encourage others. And then as I began thinking about 
um, other stories that I could name this story, I was almost overwhelmed by the number of stories that I think about in our congregation, and I was encouraged by the number of you, and as I look around this room, I could start to name situations, um, and these are all specific things. I think about some of you who are experiencing physical challenges, some of you that are experiencing difficulty with the child, maybe a child that's taking, made a choice that you don't, um, that's just difficult, made your relationship complicated and difficult. Some of you who have faced relational challenges, maybe a broken relationship or just a difficult relationship, or some of you who have experienced incredible grief as you miss somebody, um, you may have lost somebody in the past few years that has been near and dear to you, and you're walking a journey of grief and remain faithful. Or there may be financial challenges. I know some of you are facing financial challenges. But as I look around and I think about some of you who are online, I'm encouraged by the faith that you continue to exist in the midst of challenge. And I believe that God in our midst is doing what Paul wrote about in the words uh, he wrote about in these words from Romans chapter 5. It says, we can rejoice too that when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how... Uh, for we know how dearly God loves us, for he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. And I see this God, I see God doing this in your lives in many kinds of situation. And that encourages me to choose wisely in the midst of the difficulty that I'm, that when I experience it. Now we're going to leave the story of Joseph today, but we'll pick it up next week when Joey is going to continue and tell us the rest of the story but as we wrap up, I just want to pray for us and pray for us to respond well in the midst of the challenges that we're facing. Now, Father God, I want to begin by just saying thank you. Thank you that we have stories like the story of Joseph, but ultimately at the center of our faith is a Savior who responded in the midst of the most difficult suffering. In fact, he sacrificed his own life to bless us and to bring us good. And he responded in a way that was unnatural. He loved his enemies and he blessed those that persecuted him. But Jesus did it so that the course of our life could be different and that we could have a different kind of relationship with God. And Father, as I think about so many people in this room, uh, and online, Father, I pray that you would continue to be with them in the midst of the challenges that they face. I pray that you would be with them in a new year of opportunity. And maybe they're, being, maybe they're challenges, they're called to a new level of leadership or a new level of responsibility. I pray that they would lean on you, that they would choose to respond to the challenge or the blessing wisely. And that in so doing, they would be a blessing to others. They would reflect you and that they would be changed. And we pray all this in Jesus' name.